countdown. I am the special countdown. I can count backwards from 10. Can you still hear, Joan? <laughs> Say what? I tried to play it softly. <laughs> Just before Shannon gives some announcements, I'm going to invite you to stand, and I'm going to pray. There isn't any part that I am prepared to do without having the presence of God. So right from the outset of this service, Father, we come to you. You said in your word that when we worship you, we must worship in spirit and in truth. I thank you for each part of this service. Even the announcements, your presence that breaks and destroys every yoke of bondage, that meets every tired heart and those that are weary in their mind. I ask that this day, you would implant in us, for your word declares faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word. And we thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> For those who are just uh, visiting with us today, we want to welcome you, and uh, we have a June calendar that's available at our information desk. Uh, a reminder that this evening, Alpha is from 6 to 8 p.m., and uh, so we'll be joining here at 6 o'clock here at Bethel, and again next Sunday, the same time, 6 to 8. And uh, we wanted to remind you that 6 p.m. on Wednesday is our, our prayer meeting. And we have Friday night gathering, 6.30. We have an awesome time with our Filipino family. And then I just want to invite you all to our 40th anniversary party. I said last week I'm throwing myself ourselves a party. Not just myself. Ourselves are having a party. <laughs> Yeah, so that's next Saturday at 2 p.m., so we just encourage you to join with us, and we welcome you to do that. And I've had several people, the ladies, just, what do I bring? Well, just bring some finger foods, and uh, we'll have cake and just some photos. I'm going to show, show you 40 years of photos of our family and, and our ministry, so you're welcome to join with us. Seniors, uh, the seniors' lunch is coming up a week from Tuesday, so that's not this Tuesday, but a week later. So there's a sign-up sheet on the information desk. Make sure you sign up for that. And uh, I think that's all I have right now. Pastor Ron. Praise the Lord. What a great day. Happy Father's Day. You know, I was thinking of a song. My sister, bless her, she reminded me. You know, 
I, those of you that went to Sunday school years ago, do you remember a song? Father Abraham and many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. So were you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right hand, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Let's praise the Lord. Left hand, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. So are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right foot, Father Abraham had many sons. So many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. So are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Left foot. Father Abraham and many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Who would ever think? So anyway. I told them I wasn't going to practice that song. We didn't practice that song. The rest of the musicians, I'm not sure they knew what we were doing. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. I am glad for Abraham, Father Abraham. He did have many sons. And so we have the, the land of Israel today. We have the Jewish people. And you know, they had a, one, they had a wonderful father. They had a heavenly father. And I'll just tie it like this. He's a good, good father. It's who you are. It's, it's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've heard, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've found the tender whispers of love in the dead of night in you that you're pleased in that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I see many Hardly speak, he's so 
say, I appreciate you. So let me ask you, 
how does that make you feel to be appreciated? And we just sang, Heavenly Father, He has done so much for us. You know, your earthly father, they can let you down. I've talked to all kinds of young people where that was the case. They could not say you were a good father. In fact, when I was doing prison ministry, you couldn't keep Mother's Day cards, but you couldn't give away Father's Day cards. For some reason, a lot of people had father issues. But I know a father who will never let you down. Praise the Lord. And, and I think it's, it's healthy for us and wholesome for us and right for us to tell our Heavenly Father, I love you, adore you, I bow down before you. the Lord. I've got some more songs to sing, but there is a gentleman in this congregation who I appreciate. In fact, I, I think he's the oldest father in our congregation. And I, I, I think he's turned 90. I'm going to ask my brother Gerald if he would come. We want to wish him a happy birthday. We sure appreciate you, brother Gerald. This is a happy birthday. And you know what? Him being the oldest father, I just thought it'd be appropriate for us to hear from him. I think it, we, we've got to put our ears on and listen because I think he's got something to say. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. I've been given three directives here this morning. One is to stand up to be seen. Can you see me? The other is speak up to be heard. Can you see me or hear me? And sit down to be appreciated. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. I've been asked by men who did not have the opportunity to be a father, what is it like to be a father? It's an honor to be a father. I've been the father of three and I consider that to be an honor. One of my girls thought I should wear a flower this morning. And do you know I'd rather receive a bouquet while I'm living? I appreciate that. I'd like to try 
briefly to paint a little picture of what it's like to be a father. I only have, I believe, two hours, so I'll try to, I'll try to condense that a little bit. I look at fatherhood as a journey, a special journey through life. A journey through fields of emotion. A journey over mountains of challenge. And a journey through valleys of memories. I first became a father on the ninth day of April 1953. I held in my arms that night a fragile, frail little body, seven pounds, seven ounces, and I experienced for the first time a father's love equaled only perhaps by her mother's love. I also became aware of the awesome responsibility that was mine as a father. Became aware of the challenges that I would face to try to become the kind of father that it wanted to be. We are challenged. The Bible challenges us to be good fathers, and I'm just going to deal with one main challenge with a few sub-challenges, if you will. And I would challenge somebody to get me a little glass of water. <laughs> um, Paul, in his first letter to Timothy, said the Father has a responsibility to provide for those of his household. And he used some pretty strong language. He said, those who do not are worse than an infidel. We have a responsibility as fathers to provide for our family. And what is it we are to provide? First of all, there are life's basics. I'll try this one little sip to a time, and when the water's gone, I'm done. Life's basics. Food, shelter, and clothing. That's hard now. It takes a lot of work, a lot of planning, a lot of sacrifice, but we're challenged as fathers to provide for our families. We're challenged to provide security, safety, protection from harm. We are our children's guardians. We're challenged to instruct our children and to train them. Proverbs 20, 22 rather, and 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. 
interesting now, and I don't dare get into this this morning. In the, I don't know, they claim a child's rights, but they want to take away the rights of the parents to train their children and in a sense for the children to train the parents. Uh, I don't dare get into that this morning, do I, Pastor? No, I, I'll leave that alone, but just enough to say that it disturbs me what is going on now. But we still have as parents the responsibility and the challenge to instruct and train our children. Discipline. Proverbs 13 and 24 said, if we love our children, we'll chasten them, we'll correct them, we'll discipline them. <laughs> Just happened to think my father was not the main disciplinarian in my family. He was away a lot of the time, and my mother was very adept at applying the Board of Education to the seat of learning. Leadership. Fathers are mandated and challenged to give leadership, and leadership is best given by example. I was told a number of years ago by a father, he was a farmer at one time, and when I knew him, he was a very able pastor. He was walking from his house to the barn one morning through several inches of snow. As he neared the barn, he looked behind, and his young son was walking behind him. And he said, look, Dad, I'm walking in your footsteps. He turned his life over to the Lord, became a pastor. The son grew up, became a school teacher, a pastor and then dean of a Bible school, walking in Father's footsteps. Memories. As we walk through the valley of memories, picking up treasures to be put in our storehouse, to be retrieved later by times, I do it all the time. Memories of first steps, first words, family trips. My daughter will appreciate this. Motion sickness, barf bags, camping in the rain with a leaky tent trailer kids and mama sleeping in the car with dad in the trailer dodging raindrops. Memories, precious gems that we pick up along the way. I mentioned at the start, and I'm almost done, my first days as a father, I held in my arms a frail little body for the first time. On December 29th of this past year,
I held that same little body in my arms for the very last time. Three days later, she passed away. I learned the father's sorrow, the father's heartache, at the loss of a child. What's it like to be a father? That's a little bit of what it's like.
Cause broken people are exactly who you Give me faith like Daniel in the lion den Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness Give me a heart like David Lord be my defense so I can face my giant with confidence You took a shepherd boy my king, I'm gonna trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror because you fight for me. I'll be a champion claiming your victory. Give me faith like Daniel, the lion's den. Give me hope like the Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense so I can face my giants with confidence. I'm gonna sing and shout, shake the world, won't stop until I see them fall. I'm gonna stand up, step out when you call Jesus, Jesus. I'm gonna sing and shout and shake the walls, I won't stop until I see them fall. I'm gonna stand up, step out when you call Jesus, Jesus. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion den. Hope like the Moses in the wilderness. Give me heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion den. Give me hope like the Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense so I can face my giants with confidence. So I can face my giants with confidence. So I can face my giants. One more time. So I can face my giants with confidence. Praise the Lord. I'm just wondering, anybody got any giants? Well, you can face them. You have a wonderful Heavenly Father. Thank you. I, uh, I know Father's Day can bring up a lot of different emotions. Maybe you have a great relationship with your dad or maybe not. Or maybe you're a parent who feels like they don't measure up. So I'm going to be basically speaking to the men and, and may I just say, ladies, you can listen too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, I want to encourage you men regardless of whether you're a father or whether you're not, I encourage you to lean in and listen and understand. You realize your heavenly father is looking for faithful men. Just like himself. How many times, when we're, you know, especially when I'm with my sons, and somebody will say, my goodness, Ron, they sure look like you. Well, I feel sorry for them, actually. <laughs> In Psalm 103, verse 13, it says, The Lord is like a father to his children. He is tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are, and he remembers we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and we die. The wind blows and we're gone as though we have never been here. Well, well, life's too short. And I realize we've got families that are at odds. I realize that. But life's too short 
to keep the stuff. Basically, in my message today, I'm going to have basically two questions, and I, I hope that you will listen and hear them. The first question I have is, what is, what is your soil like? You go, Pastor Ron, that, that's, a, that's a question. Well, it comes from a story of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 3, he told many stories in the form of parables, just like the one we're going to talk about. And it says, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. Do you know I've been hearing about people putting in their gardens? And some, I heard about somebody put in a lot of tomatoes. I thought, my goodness, they're going to have a, a bushel full of, or of tomatoes. But this one, this farmer, he scatters them across his field. Some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock, and the seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and they didn't have any deep roots, and they died. <coughs> Other seeds fell, fell among th uh, thorns, that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they produced a crop. 30, 60, and even a hundred times as much as had been planted. Whew. Now how would you like to plant some seed and you get more than what you planted? Well, that's the whole idea. You plant, it's only a small part of what will be harvested. Give me men that will plant. Give me fathers that will plant. In verse 18 of that same chapter, it says, Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom. And they don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They, the Bible says that they fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represent those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth so that no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on good soil represents who truly Listen, hear, and understand. What did I say in the beginning? Hear and understand. A good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and, a, and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or 100 times as much as has been planted. You have, you have no say in the production or the size of the quality you harvest. 
you do have the say of the quality of seed. What is your ground like? What is the quality of your seed? What are you planting in you? The outcome or the harvest depends on how you work the soil. Boy, this past week, I saw my neighbor. He had a rototiller. And my goodness, I, th I think he was all day working up that soil. All day. And I'm not talking about an acre. It was, oh, I don't know, probably from here to the wall long. And about this, that much over. And he worked up that soil. I'll tell you, he worked up that soil. We had some, some guys come over and they worked up the soil in, in my, uh, I call it my wife's garden. I don't work too much in the garden. I have other things to do that are less important. You know, like the keeping of the lawn. She's producing, a, she's doing some stuff that's going to plant a harvest. I'm cutting down the dandelions. I'm not making room for the bees, they tell me. But you know, the outcome depends on how you work the soil. How you work the soil. You know, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, it says that God... The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden. He placed man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. He does tell him, you can freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden except of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But he put man in the garden to tend it and to watch over it. Now that Hebrew word there is abad. I didn't say bad, I said abad. And that Hebrew word is to work, to serve, to tend. It means to work for another and serve another by labor. It means to serve as subjects. It, means, uh, it even means to work or till the land. That's, that's really cool. That, that sounds like work to me. That ground's got to be worked up. That's what man was intended to do. But there's another part of what man was intended to do in that garden. It was the Hebrew word zamar. And that word means to keep, to guard, to observe, to give heed, and to watch. To have charge. To protect, to observe, to keep, retain, and treasure up, even to restrain and to reserve. Did mankind do that in that first garden? No, he didn't. He did not guard it. He allowed an intruder into that garden. The ground it's got to be worked up. That's something that we must do with our lives. We've got to take care of the ground. We've got to work it. We've got to guard our hearts. For from it is the source of life. There's so many that have a, a heart condition. And some don't know what they have a heart condition. Their heart has been hurt. Their heart has been wounded. Their heart has been deceived. So they do not have the harvest that God intended them. With the heart we reason. The heart is a place of, de of decision. It is the center of of who we are. Yet the heart must be worked. It must be cultivated. It's got to be tilled. It's got to be planted. It's got to be watered. <coughs> the devil himself. Will come in to try and disrupt things. Just like 
in that first garden? What was the result of what happened in the first garden when they did not keep out the intruders and they did not work it? In Genesis chapter 3, God said to the man, since you, oh boy, I just can't wait to read this one. Uh, really, how many times do, do I not listen to my wife? She, some tell me it's selective hearing. I tell you, maybe, sometimes. But I'll tell you, God said, since you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree, it's one thing to listen, it's another thing to do. It would have been a good thing to acknowledge the fact that she spoke. I get that. I can get in an awful lot of trouble when I get home. God gave us two ears and one mouth. My one ear is not as good as my other ear. Depending what side you're sitting on, I might hear you, I might not hear you. But I'll tell you, God said, you listened to your wife and, and, and you ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. <coughs> the ground is cursed, not because of your wife, because of you. Everyone is to make up their own decision, their own mind. Everyone has that ability. That is a God-given ability. Some people will accept Christ as Savior and some will not. Everybody has that freedom of choice. Boy. All of your life you will struggle to scratch for a living. It will grow, God said, thorns and thistles for you. Although you will eat from its grain, you're going to have thorns and and thistles to deal with. It did not have to be that way. Now let's go back to the parable in Luke 8. The farmer plants. He scatters. And, and, you know, and I don't know why he didn't, doesn't say he worked up the soil or anything else. <coughs> Excuse me. It just says he scattered the seed. When I read this a number of years ago, I read that and I thought, Man, that farmer's not very smart. He's just scattering seed. How come the light of the world went when he worked that seed? And then I learned who the father was, or who the farmer was, and I went, sorry. He, he's, he's scattering the seed and some of the ground that it falls on. The fact is, God loves us so much. He's scattering the seed whosoever will may come. He's throwing the seed out there for all kinds of people that can grab hold of it and make decisions and do things with it. But the scripture, I discover, has a lot to say about the thorns, the thistles, and the briars. You see, Israel, they were a people after God's own heart. Excuse me again. Isaiah chapter 5 and 6 says, I will make a wild place where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed. A place overgrown by briars and thorns. And I will command the clouds to drop no rain on it. Do you know that Israel in their relationship with God had become hardened, and they actually turned away from their heavenly father. And God allowed the land of Egypt, because of the decisions 
that Israel had made. It became a place of briars and thorns. In Isaiah 7, 23, in the day the lush vineyards now worth a thousand pieces of silver will become patches of briars and thorns. The entire land will become a vast expanse of briars and thorns, a hunting ground overrun by wildlife. No one will go to the fertile hillsides where the, where the gardens once grew, for briars and thorns will cover them. Israel had allowed themselves because of their choices not only the choices in their lives. They were to put no other gods before the Lord God. They went after and served other gods. That isn't the way you work up and till up the ground when it comes time to God. Jeremiah 12, verse 13, he says, God says, my people have planted wheat, but are harvesting thorns. They have worn themselves out, but has done them no good. They will harvest a crop of shame because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Dear Lord, Israel had not looked after things very well. Yet we can't point our fingers at Israel and say, why did you do it like that? Why did you live your life like that? Why did you get away from God? Because <coughs> all kinds of us have. All kinds of people have turned their own way. All kinds of them. Yet the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. <coughs> it can happen. It happened to Israel. It can happen to us. If we do not abad and zamar, our lives will not be pleasing to our Heavenly Father. If we do not guard and keep it. Sometimes we work so hard, we get so busy that the thorns come up into our heart. My second question is, the first question, remember, how was your ground? The second one is, how is your heart? Routine, religious routine can rob you of God's moving in your life. <coughs> have, you, <coughs> have you put down the tools that cultivate, that works the ground? And yet, have you allowed thistles and briars and weeds to take away from the harvest that God has for you in your life? Is your heart filled with guilt and shame? Are you living in that, well, I'm not good enough syndrome? It's not about your goodness. It is about your repentance before God. And you're receiving and asking him for his help. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, keep your heart. Keep your heart. The NLT reads, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. One scripture says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Keep your heart. Guard your heart. For from it, in fact, this translation I'm using, it says, keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flows the springs of life. <laughs> so are you allowing the springs of God to, oh, to flow in your life? Guard it, keep it, preserve it, guard it from dangers, guard your heart. We are no longer living in the days of Adam and Eve. Jesus has redeemed us 
And we have authority and power to do different than the first Adam did. It's not about what you do for God, but it is about what you do with God. You work, we are to work with him. How do we work with him? It's by faith, glory to God. So turn to your neighbor and say, how is your faith level? Hmm. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, To everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each a measure of faith. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13 says that we ought to continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. One translation says, be holy, God says, be holy, for I am holy. Well, you cannot make yourself holy. But as you find, as you submit yourself, and as you surrender yourself to the presence and the power of God, he will cause you and help you to measure up by his spirit to the fullness and complete standard of Christ. In other words, you will grow to be like Jesus. I can see they're all excited about that. But I'll tell you what. That's what this thing is all about. Being like Jesus. Well, how can I do that, Pastor? Well, it's quite easy. You get into a body, and the body talks about that the body of Christ is the body of Christ. The body, the church is the body of Christ. Christ being the head of the church. Together, collectively, we are to uh, be just like Jesus. Somebody says, well, how do I get started? Well, you don't necessarily have to start with great faith. God has given you a measure of faith. There are some where the Father has, has given them a gift of faith. Right at the moment, right when, when they, somebody needs it, people get healed and all kinds of stuff. You can use your faith for that. But I would say that the place to start is maybe not with towers, maybe not with cancer or houses, but, you know, you can start with being obedient. When God gives you something to do, you can, baby faith can grow from it. Let me tell you, what kind of faith you need. You only need faith the size of a mustard seed. You say, well, well, let me tell you, in Genesis chapter 1, as God created man in his own image, he created them, told them to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and, and, uh, and uh, you, you know, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus says, what is the kingdom of God like? You ever wondered what the kingdom of God is like? Well, he's, God says, Jesus says, let me illustrate. It is like a tiny mustard seed that a man planted in a garden, and it grows and becomes a tree, and the birds make its nest. It only takes a mustard seed now, I put three in here, by the way. If you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. I could have put more, but I like try, try, try. You don't need to give up. Your, your faith is not in yourself. Your faith is in an almighty God. In uh, 
Matthew chapter 13, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but it becomes the largest of the garden plants. It grows into a tree and the birds come and make their branches in it. In Matthew 17 it says, I tell you the truth, if you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here and it would move. doesn't say it might move. It says it will move. It says nothing would be impossible. Give me men that have mustard seed faith. We'll move a lot of mountains around here. Glory to God. Move mountains in our community. Move mountains in our, in our province. And by the way, uh, Gerald mentioned about some of the things that are happening in our schools. My wife and I were at the Legislative Assembly. We heard what they said. We heard all the arguments. And I'll say we got copies of some letters, that some sample letters. I would suggest to you that it might be advantageous for you to grab hold of one of those sample letters and write our premier and to write uh, our minister of education and let them know how much you appreciate the fact that they're standing for the rights of parents. There is something you can do. It's just a little act, but it brings big dividends. Glory to God. It only takes a small seal, seed to deal with a mulberry tree. You go on exercising faith and allow it to grow. And the father says, okay, that mountain will move. But you know, it still takes the size of a mustard seed to move the mountain. The size of the problem doesn't matter. Peter was walking on the water in Matthew 14. And Jesus immediately grabbed him and said, you know, you got little faith. Why did you doubt? But the fact is, Peter was the only one that stepped out of the boat. He was the only one that walked on the water. Now you can be like the guys that stay in the boat, or you can be like Peter that steps out, takes hold of the sea. I believe that the Father is looking for faithful men and women who are willing to work with him in partnership just as Jesus did. So my prayer is, give me men, O oh Lord, that will have a godly confidence to speak to the mulberry trees and will speak to the, to the and, and will become the great trees. Give us men that will plant a, the, with, by the, by a, like a, a, a mustard seed to speak to mountains and, and let them move. That's why we sing, give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. So I can take care of the giants as I face them. Glory to God. I was going to sing another song, but I think we should return to that one. Glory to God. And by the way, I have all kinds of these little bags for all the men. And if you will, just come and line up here in this uh, front. I know we're online and all that kind of stuff, but I have a package for you to remind you it only takes faith the size. These are actual, actual mustard seeds. They are, I put them in here to remind you, it only takes a mustard seed. You don't have to have the great faith of a great evangelist to do God's work. I can see you're all excited about that. I'm going to ask the men to come and line up here. Glory to God. And you know what? If you want to line up in the aisles too, I'm okay with that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Father God, all the men, I did say that. Praise the Lord. I call them anyway. Glory to God. I got more. If you don't want to be up here, that's fine. You can still get them. I can still got some here. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I ask that your word, it may be in seed form, Lord, because they may get more out of this than, than I'll ever know. Some will actually plant this thing and watch the tree grow. Some will keep it in the bag. And it may not do much, but it'll be other than it'll be a reminder of what you have designed for them. In Jesus' name. Somebody says, is this all we get? No, there's more things at the back there. You may even have four. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. You only got one in there? No, you got more. There's three. Good. They're so small. They are so small. They are the smallest of the seeds. Well, sure. Yes, I know he would be. I got a few more in here. Glory to God. Father, I thank you for each one of these men. Some are at the front here and some are in their seats and there are some that are working online. In Jesus' name, may your spirit work in them. In the name of Jesus, may your spirit work in them to do your good pleasure. I ask that you would work through them in Jesus' name. Now, just before we get back to the other song, I do think I need to sing this. I guess I won't. She's muted. They don't want me to play. Come and join the reapers, all the kingdom seekers, laying down your life to find it in the end. Come and share the harvest, help to light the darkness for the Lord is calling faithful men come and join the reapers all the kingdom see Yeah. 
stand Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness Give me a heart like David for me my defense so I can face my giants I can face my giants so I can face my giants so I can face my giants so I can face my giants with confidence I'm gonna sing and shout shake the walls my walls are on till I see them fall gonna stand up step out when you call Jesus, Jesus, I'm gonna sing and shout and shake the wall. I won't stop until I see them fall. Gonna step, stand up, step out when you call Jesus, Jesus. Give me faith like Daniel in the mighty face my giants with confidence so I can face my giants with confidence so father in Jesus name I thank you for confidence that you are building in these men thank you Lord as they put to work the seed that you have given them. Bless them in their rising up and their sitting down. Bless them in their going out and their coming in. Bless them in the works of their hands. Bless them in the places where they go. In the name of Jesus, we charge you to be strong and courageous in Jesus' name as you work for him and with him. Amen. God bless you.